So I think a lot of people are watching what's going on in Kenosha, and they're obviously following the police shooting of Jacob Blake, uh, the protests, the riots, then there was another shooting. Uh, you know, everyone's so focused kind of on projecting, I think, what's happening in the larger kind of context of the election, of what's happening with uh, the police reform movement, uh, so on and so forth. But I think what's really being lost here is, like, what what's the story of this town? Like, what exactly uh, is Kenosha all about? You know, what what's the background? What's the history? Who are the people who live there? Uh, what's the mayor like? So on and so forth. And uh, someone who knows that very intimately is Steve Horn. Steve Horn's a journalist. Uh, he works at The Real News, uh, and he's done some really awesome, like, investigative work on environmental issues, on a number of accountability issues. And it just so happens that he was happened to be born and raised in Kenosha. So I thought Steve would be a great guest to have on this episode just to, like, introduce this town to America properly, because I don't think people are getting a very clear picture of just what kind of place this is uh, just from seeing selective imagery or, or, or interviews solely related to the, to the police shooting and the aftermath. So, Steve... Uh, it's great to have you. Uh, start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and like and like you know growing up in Kenosha and what that was like. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, so I think just kind of telling my family story a little bit about how we got to Kenosha it could be an example a little bit of uh, like how how people come to Kenosha. Like, what is Kenosha? Why why do they come there? What, what's the job market like, et cetera. So, um, my family, I was not born in Kenosha. I was born in Evanston, Illinois, um, which is a suburb of Chicago. Um, and that's, my mom grew up in the Chicago area. Uh, Skokie is where she grew up and lived there until she was a young adult until like her young thirties. Then she met my dad, they got married. And this is a uh, probably a pretty typical story of, I would say post-industrial Kenosha, uh, which is why do you move there now? Um, we'll get into the industrial part later, but why would you move there? 1988 is when Chrysler closed a lot of jobs down. They closed their main factory down, so those 5,500 jobs. So people kept moving there after, and the main reason would be like when my parents moved there, which is it's much more affordable place to live than Chicagoland area um, in terms of property taxes, in terms of just being able to like build a sustainable life. So that's what Kenosha really became... And I'll talk about the Chrysler period and how it changed more in depth, but it, it has become largely, not 100%, but in, in large part, a kind of what's called a bedroom community, which is a lot of people who live there, live there because it's situated halfway between Milwaukee and Chicago. And it's important to know, if you look at it on a map, it's on the same highway, I-94. Um, it's a little closer to Milwaukee than Chicago, but probably more people actually have jobs in the Chicagoland area than Milwaukee because it's connected to a key train line, uh, a commuter train line that's owned by Union Pacific called the Metra train. So that's the same train. My mom, and the example would be, they moved to Kenosha. My mom kept her job still where she was working in Evanston, her entire working life actually at, um, at an, a nonprofit. And my dad got a job in Kenosha, but there were several jobs in Kenosha <laughs> kind of scrapped by, but um, yeah, that's my family story. That's how we got there. So that's where I grew up. Uh, I mean, I was only two years old, so I really have like no memory of being an Illinois person, even though that's where I was technically born. But, um, yeah, so we moved there when I was really young and in terms of the, like, what, what is it now that gets into the post-industrial kind of era or the different industries era, I would say people call it, I think there's this, um, people want to equate Kenosha with like a Detroit or, um, some about, you know, Flint or something, because they're kind of in the similar, the Midwest, they had the auto industry there. It's a little bit different in how it's evolved. Um, and that has to do exactly with the geography that I described. So Kenosha was on par, uh, I wouldn't say like an, e an equal with Detroit, but it was a competitor with Detroit in its heyday. So why did people originally come to Kenosha in the early 1900s? Uh, that's when the auto industry started in Kenosha. And it, it went through several different names. I think it was called Nash at the time of the early 1900s. It evolved into being called American Motor Corporation. Uh, the same auto assembly line built the first sedan, basically, uh, called the Rambler. And through the decades, uh, it attracted you know, thousands of jobs. In its heyday in the 60s, it was, I want to say, 16,000 jobs. And they were part of the United Auto Workers, UAW. The first, and it was the first ever um, fully uh, unionized 
uh, auto assembly line. So I think that's really important to point out. 1933, which is two years before the, I think the one that pe- people know, uh, labor history, they might know about 1935 in Flint with the uh, unionization. But Kenosha was actually like a huge epicenter of union action and strikes and all of that a little bit before even Flint and uh, what happened in Michigan. So it was always a little bit smaller version of what was happening in Detroit and Michigan. I think that's what actually ended up sinking it a little bit is it was just not quite big enough to compete. And over time, the forces of globalization and all of that brought it down. So fast forward to 1988, um, at the the time it was owned by Chrysler, which bought American Motor Corporation, forgot the year, but several years before. um, There was another French company that owned it before that for a little bit. And 1988, Chrysler basically gave an ultimatum, and there was several uh, things that they negotiated to, you know, get less pay, uh, less union benefits, and they actually did concede. But it was it was kind of it felt like a fait accompli at that point, and the the plant shut down in 1988, and and that gets into this. <laughs> so there's a New York Times story that talks about how to fast forward to today, uh, we're living through in, in what the story is saying is that. 2020 in Kenosha is kind of like a 1988 moment where the city is at a crossroads and a crisis and all of that. But what what the story leaves out is literally all the history between 1988 and 2020, as if like nothing happened in Kenosha. It doesn't explain like why are people, why did people stay in Kenosha for 32 more years if there was no jobs there, if Chrysler had left. And that, that gets to the key point is that it's, I guess you could call it post-industrial, but not really, just that the industry, the predominant industry has changed. So now the jobs that once were Chrysler uh, union jobs, they're now like the biggest employer now in Kenosha is Amazon. So in 2015, so 2010, and, and that's the other big part of the story. They say Chrysler shut down in 1988. Chrysler mostly shut down in 1988, but they kept the assembly line closed down, but they were still building engines until 2010, which then the Great Recession happened. Hey, Steve, addition- just, to, just to be clear, when you say Amazon is the biggest employer, you're talking about fulfillment centers? Correct. Okay. Yeah, correct. And that gets into the whole logistics, right? It's by uh, Highway 94, which connects to Chicago and Milwaukee. And, and, and w- would you say that that resulted in a um, in sort of a, a, sh- a downward shift in socioeconomic status? Or was it sort of a, a lateral move? I mean, most people, I think, assume that it's a downward shift. But I mean, just to clarify. Yeah, I would say if you look at the... Like, because I, I mean, I'm not 100% sure what their wages are, but I'm pretty sure I want to say that they're, they're pretty similar to what the wages were back in the 1980s for what you can earn for those Amazon jobs. But this is like, you know, over 30 years later. So in real, real well, wages, buying power, it's, it's not uh, not I mean, it's it's the same for everyone else around the country. I mean, they're exactly not- exactly. So, yeah, I think that's crucial to point out. And yeah, I mean, the technology basically became a logistics kind of place besides the engine plant closing it, it stayed open all the way until 2010 that was like a little bit over 500 jobs so there's still a pretty big presence of chrysler all the way through 2010 and then that that was gone so what 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 has filled its place is now it's 3,000 amazon jobs and there's another company that's really important to point out called uline which is owned by this uh pretty power politically powerful family the ulines who give a lot of money to Republican Party officials and to like the right wing machinery, if you will, um, especially in Wisconsin, um, even though they live in um, Illinois. But they I think it gets to my my point is what what happened in the Kenosha area is they've offered a lot of tax benefits and subsidies and stuff for companies like Uline and Amazon to come in. So Amazon benefited from thirty two million dollars in subsidies. So it's kind of become, it's filled the void, but these companies kind of come in because they can have land for cheap and pay workers what they pay them, which is, it's not like terrible, it's not like a travesty or anything. I mean, I think that people can still live their lives in Kenosha because it's not, you know, it's a place where you can live with, you know, a little bit less money than if you were in, I don't know, like Chicago or something. But yeah, so I think that, that's sort of like the, 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 the short version of Kenosha. It's It's still, I mean, there's still a lot of jobs. And the other part of the thing is, I said that it kind of has become a bedroom community. There's a there's a large service economy, right? So besides the industries, what what a lot of the jobs are even lower paid jobs, which are, you know, you work for I don't know like a chain restaurant, or you work for the local movie theater. I mean, it's it's a you could call it like a pretty thriving suburb, I would say, but it definitely has created polarities in income. So I mean, there's the the beneficiaries of the bedroom community probably don't even do that much of their work in Kenosha, but. Yeah, you know, they still utilize the services and stuff, and and so it's 
probably pretty typical of any other suburb. And I think it should be described more now as instead of a post-industrial town, more of a kind of a mix of a logistical economy and um, a bedroom community suburb. I mean, it does sound to me like a post-industrial town in the sense of like, maybe not in the sense of uh, a Detroit where there are, you know, there's just complete lack of jobs, but certainly in the sense of like uh, a community that where people's parents uh, worked in unionized jobs um, for, you know, pr- pretty solid uh, middle-class wages. Um, and now their kids are, are working in non-union crappy wage service sector jobs. Great point. And yeah, and I want to say the other thing is, I, I didn't mention it in the history, but like, how did, relatively speaking, Kenosha is probably more diverse than most of the state. Um, the state, if you look at the demographics, is 87% white and then 13% other races. And um, Kenosha is, I mean, people would say it still sounds pretty white, but it's 73% white population. This is as of, I think, 2019 estimate by the U.S. Census. And it's 10% African American, 17% Latino, some other and smaller percentages of some other races. But a lot of the history has to do with the auto industry. I mean, uh, there's a book that uh, it's called The End of the Line, which is by an anthropologist that came out in 1994 explaining what like, the significance of the closure in 1988 and kind of what that meant for the city, but also some of the history of the Chrysler plant. And basically, the book says that in the 50s and 60s, a lot of the migration to Kenosha uh, was, you know, from the South, from people, uh, Latino community and from, I guess, in, probably most of the Mexican-American community and then um, the African-American community saw it as a place to come for jobs. So I think that's how how and why Southeast Wisconsin, I say more broadly than just Kenosha, that's why it's more diverse probably than a lot of the rest of the state was because of the legacy of those jobs. That kind of explains what, I mean, I kind of getting to today, like it might confuse some people why there's like ra- racial tensions and a, a diversity of people in this random Southeast Wisconsin city. But that's that's sort of the, the background as to why. I think a lot of people around the country right now are kind of thinking to themselves like, you know, is this just going to happen anywhere where we see the killing of an unarmed civilian, right? Like in any city um, where we see something like this happen, is a riot just going to break out? Or is there something specific about a Kenosha where these two things have to sort of mix. So, I mean, I'm wondering what the balance is and what you think, you know, if there is something specific about Kenosha um, that, you know, doesn't doesn't necessarily mean like, you know, that specific thing led to this, but like, is there a mix that you think needs to happen? And did we see that in Kenosha? Is there something about that place? Well, okay. So I think that there's, there's a narrative in Kenosha right now that among people who are from there, um, and maybe this is probably the same everywhere you go, but the people from there are saying, well, we had nothing to do with the rioting and the, and the violence. Um, that's out of towners. That's I've even, I had a, my former cross country and track coach. Uh, he wanted to run, he was doing a GoFundMe thing for recovery for the city and for like, just creating like positive vibes, which I think a lot of people are trying to do now. And in his thing, in his write up, he, he, he said, it's all, um, this was caused by out of town invaders. <laughs> and I think that's that's a thing that prevails. But I mean, it's probably in large part true. I think there's a lot of people who flock to Kenosha because I think it's probably happening everywhere around the country right now. As you see one of these violent shootings happen and then they kind of project what they want in the city and what's wrong with the city. They come in and do their thing. And I'm sure that that's the case with Kenosha because it's conveniently located. It's not too far from Chicago. It's not too far from Milwaukee. It's really easy to get to from the highway. It's not too far from Madison, Wisconsin. So all those three of those cities have pretty big activist bases um, compared to Kenosha, which, you know, to be frank, like Kenosha is not a place that has all that much of this kind of street style activism. I never, I never encountered street style activism my entire time living in Kenosha. It's, I don't want to call it an apolitical city, but it expresses its politics in um, kind of unique ways, which is, I mean, people vote. If you look at the percentages in 2016, a lot of people vote. But, um, and people speak out about things, I guess you could say, but it, it's just not, it's, yeah. It's, I, I get, it's not Portland, right? It's not it's Seattle. It's not Portland, exactly. And that's, and that's why I think a lot of people kind of, you know, will naturally look at this and be like, well, wow, if it happens in Kenosha, this could happen anywhere where we yeah. see just like an instance of, something that people consider to be police abuse, if that, you know, if it can happen in Kenosha. So I'm just curious, like, 
you know, is how close to reality is that? I mean, is Kenosha every town America where this could happen? Or is there something that still needs to be kind of present and in place? I, th- I mean, I kind of think it is. I mean, I would never have thought it would happen in Kenosha like this. And um, yeah, I think it's possible. And, I, and that gets to my, my, the reason I brought up the out of town invaders thing is because if you look at the, the very first day when the shooting happened, and it's pretty understandable, I would say like, people are outraged. It was just horrific. Um, but it's kind of hard to believe that like right after it happened, because I know that if you look at the videos and stuff that are happening that night, that people were breaking into, I think the, the courthouse and some other smashing in the windows of other, other stores and stuff. It's hard to believe that within hours that there was out of towners. So I think that at least the initial stuff was coming, had to have come from people in the city who were like in the immediate vicinity and, you know, able to do that kind of thing. And I think, I guess, to answer your question, I think that it probably could happen. And if it could happen in Kenosha, it could probably happen pretty much anywhere. I'm talking about, like, this is not a city that is, I've, I've, it's never happened before in Kenosha. Um, like I said, it doesn't have, it, it, people are active, but not in this kind of way. And um, people have their opinions. People express their opinions in weird ways. It gets to, like, the whole thing with, it votes in weird ways. In 2016, it voted for Trump. In 2008, it voted for Biden. But during that same time, people were voting for a mix of sometimes voting for Russ Feingold, sometimes voting for Ron Johnson, sometimes voting for Paul Ryan. It's kind of all over the place politically. People are are just very reactive to the moment in Kenosha. It it sort of seems like almost a bellwether the way you kind of describe the politics, right? If in 2008, it was Obama, 2016, it was Trump. Yeah. For Russ Feingold um, when he got elected. I mean, that's. The last thing we all want is for Kenosha to be a bellwether. I mean, that's <laughs> and and the sad reality is I think Kenosha is going to become the. It's already be, it's already become I think and when I saw it happen I knew it was going to happen because if you know the 2016 history you knew it was going to become the bellwether in this weird kind of sick way with this incident all over again but in in a in a way where it's like much more the focal point as opposed to just like kind of behind the scenes if you know what's going on in politics you know it's key now it's going to be front and center in our faces that it's this place and it is an important county because it's one of the i think it's the fourth biggest maybe i think by, by city kenosha is the fourth biggest city in the state by county kenosha county might be the third biggest county i'm not 100 percent sure third or fourth biggest so um yeah i think it's going to be crucial um and that's why of course that's why trump is going to go visit on tuesday and show up at these destructive sites and i mean we I should think- also bear in mind that the unrest started in 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 minneapolis which is you know a liberal town certainly but it's not it's not Seattle or Portland, you know, it's it's not like some sort of Antifa type of, um, uh, you know, um, it's, it's not full of like virtue signaling, you know, PhD holding leftists, I, I, I would imagine. So it right. does seem like it's a homegrown phenomenon and not just one, you know, not just the kind of LARPing that we're seeing in the Pacific Northwest. But yeah, and yeah, like, I mean, talk, talk we, we can talk about the PhD thing for a second. Like Kenosha doesn't even, I think you can't even earn a PhD in Kenosha. I think that they have, uh, I mean, I know there's two colleges, but I think the most you can earn is a... Uh, is a master's kind of thing. So, yeah, it's not really that kind of city. I think that's the other thing I want to say about Kenosha is uh, just to kind of explain, like, growing up there, what, what, what do you do to – I mean, your whole thing when you grow up there is you just want to get out of Kenosha. You you, um, you work as hard as – I mean, if, you, if you're privileged enough or whatever, you have, like, the, the family background, you – you you know, whatever your family puts you in the position to do this, you, you try to study as hard as you can basically to get out of there. And I think most, most people's goal is to go to University of Wisconsin, which is in Madison – which is the in-state school, but kind of a well-known national brand for, for a lot of people go elsewhere after that. But it's, we call it Kenoware, which is like kind of, you know, no one really cares about Kenosha, but it's, it's kind of weird that like what we call Kenoware is now like everyone's watching it. And I think other people have, other people have said that in quotes and stuff at this point who are from the city. But to me, I was just thinking, how the heck did people f- suddenly learn about Kenosha from this kind of <laughs> crazy incident? But yeah, so, I mean... I mean, I would say that I have almost no, yeah, sorry to go full circle on this. I have almost no, none of the friends that, almost none of the friends I grew up with live there anymore. So that's kind of gives you a picture of those who try to get out really do get out. And they kind of. Steve, I was curious about one thing. Like, so we saw a lot of imagery of things on fire. There were protests, there's riots. There was the shooting that occurred at the protest. Where was that all taking place? Like, what kind of, what, like, every town has, you know, Working class neighborhoods, upscale neighborhoods, it has government kind of districts, it has rural districts. 
what part of town was that that it was all taking place what kind of com- what part of the community and, and why was it all taking place there do you think yeah there's two different main places where this stuff was ha- i would say three and they were i mean it's not like a huge city so they're not they're not all that far apart from one another but the main the most destructive part like where the the main burning down was and um yeah this i mean the the stuff that you're probably gonna see trump go visit on tuesday we'll just say because that's where the worst of it happened that's in a place called uptown which is about a mile from downtown and that's a super working class i think pretty racially diverse area i would say probably has a mix of you know black latino and also white it's just but it's definitely i mean yeah it's not it's not really like the i would say it's not really the area that i would have maybe hung out around as a kid kind of to say but it it you know, it's not, it's not like a scary place or anything, but it's definitely just, um, it's, yeah, I think it, it, that's the tragedy of, I think, a lot of that part is that that was the, probably like one of the, it hasn't really been revitalized yet by the city, unlike the, the lakefront area, which they've really hyped up more and built up more. It's a really beautiful area. That part is just had not received that kind of attention from the city yet. So, um, yeah, that that's one part. And then if you go to where the, the most violent stuff is so that was violence towards like buildings and burning down the most violent in terms of like people being hurt in the shootings and and and, uh stuff that happened i guess this was this past tuesday night that is on sheridan road which is um and it's uh i would say sheridan road the unique thing about that road that probably no one noticed who watched it sheridan road actually connects all the way if you follow it it goes all the way to chicago or the chicago land area and that that took place I mean, that took place really close to actually where I um, I grew up Jewish. That took really place really close to my synagogue where I grew up, and um, yeah, it's kind of like the middle. I'd say like the middle of the city. Sheridan Road is probably one of the most busy roads in the city. Although now it's like people who are protesting, so they, they might have blocked it off from traffic. Um, but yeah, it's really um, a thoroughfare for the city. And yeah, the other part is the Civic Center area where I think that they fortresses that off the most for. Uh, the National Guard and the police. And, yeah, I think that between those, they're all pretty. that's pretty close to where the, the shooting took place. It's within uh, maybe, like, five, six blocks of where the, the worst thing happened on Tuesday. Um, but, yeah, and then there's the whole other part of where the original shooting took place, which is in a slightly different area of the city. Not not that far from there either, though. Probably, like, within about a mile from uh, where a lot of stuff has been taking place. And would you say it happened in these places because they're generally just the city centers where the action is, where people gather and where the businesses are, and it's just where all the targets would be for, you know, causing? Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah, I mean, so the, I mean, the, the the first target was, of course, the, the, I think the courthouse is what I was saying is where they originally broke into some windows and, and all that. And that's, that's the civic center area, civic center park. And that's kind of, I've, I've seen in the videos, that's where a lot of the marches start and then yeah from there it's not that far from downtown i mean that's right that's basically is downtown over there so i think so yeah and and another thing is i think the city has prioritized the downtown because it's uh it's a place that they've probably spent the most money and put the most resources into building up so i'm guessing what happened um is that they didn't put as much of a priority on the uptown area for protecting it and all that and they i think they were pretty stretched thin and so that area got completely destroyed basically whereas the downtown was probably more well protected was probably the first priority and it didn't i know there's been some criticism of that that it's uh well you didn't you didn't care about the racially diverse area you only cared about the downtown so you just let uptown burn i think that that kind of speaks more broadly i think it's a little bit different than that i think they probably would have cared still about maintaining the uptown but they they didn't have enough people on the ground at the very beginning um, in terms of the national guard in terms of policing forces they just reacted definitely too slowly to what the situation was. And I think that they had, they were probably picking and choosing. I don't think it was based on any vindictiveness, but they were, I mean, there's a lot of people in the city at that time and it was chaotic. So to me, I, I don't think that anyone wanted to see the uptown area burn that's in city leadership either. Steve, is there a, is there a history that you're aware of, of tensions with the police? Um, I mean, those exist in every city, but um, that, you know, above and beyond uh, what you would expect in any average American city? Yeah, there's been, I mean, that's what I said right when it happened is there was actually a, a pretty bad shooting of a, of a white guy in 2004, um, which was not too far from where I grew up. And he came home from a night of drinking um, and 
came out of his car, he got stopped, and then you can't really, there's not, it was before the age of um, cell phone, you know, smartphone cameras and stuff, so all you have is the dash cam video, but from, uh, you know, basically what's come out of it is they, they kind of just shot him right in the head. It was, it's a really horrific situation. They, they've never really been held accountable by it. His name is Michael Bell. So his dad has been pretty active in trying to, and has successfully enacted some police reforms in Wisconsin since. But yeah, that was another key one. So 16 years ago. And I, I think that the, there's been other incidents since. I, I do think that this police force has, um, pretty uh you know a pretty sketchy track record in, in some ways for sure so i think that that's i wasn't it wasn't like completely shocked when when this had happened uh 16 years later after that there's another i'll say i know there's another one like there's five years ago where a cop killed two people within 10 days and what did, how did the police respond they put up a, a billboard in the middle of the city and, and and with the actual police officer who had done the two killings and put him next to like a canine dog smiling kind of just saying like support the police so yeah i mean they handle these things in completely i mean just pretty ham-handed kind of ham-fisted kind of ways for sure and i think that that is and if you look at their response to this one and how how they've kind of talked about what happened then i think that it's you can you can kind of see history repeating itself in in from these other incidents do you have a sense of like um the uh general profile of like the people who took part in the in the rioting and the looting specifically like the actual you know the violence and the property damage and stuff like you know in terms of racial socioeconomics age what and just just the general profile of like why someone in kenosha would have taken part in this and what the motivations would be yeah that's a good question i mean i think it's definitely i mean for age by young people in terms of racial demographics i think I don't know for sure, actually. I think that um, on the you could see on the first day that it was um, probably a mix of people. That's the one that I saw where there, there's more video being taken of the stuff. I guess I haven't seen. I'm sure there's video that exists. I haven't reviewed like who was doing it when it happened, but it seems like it's been. I mean, I've seen I've seen a lot of white people. I'll say that. I mean, it's not. I don't say. I know the first day it was definitely probably more people who weren't white at the original originally at the courthouse for sure but i know since then i think almost symbolically of like what happened on tuesday if you look at that incident it was like all white people who were involved in the shooting and stuff like that between the protesters and the counter protesters and all of that and i think that that has definitely they've been a large presence is definitely white white folks but um yeah i don't know i, I guess i don't know if it, who's been doing all of it for sure i know, I know if you look at the protests and stuff it's definitely a diverse mix of people like just like the peaceful protests that happen when they're marching down the streets if you look at those videos it looks like a mix of white and black people um, probably latino people as well i think it's just probably the honest answer is probably just a mix of people who are doing it it's, i think it, it's probably pretty hard to uh, and different people want to say oh it was all like white people or pro probably some people want to say oh this was all black people or whatever but i think that if you look at the complexion of some of the protests and stuff it's definitely a mix of people and i'm not sure if we have video documentation of all of the incidences of buildings building uh burning down in that i'd be curious to see those but i think until we see all of those it, there's going to be different people saying it was it was this group or it was this group but how, whatever whatever the case was it the from day one because it started as breaking into buildings and busting down windows and all of that that continued for days after and i'm pretty sure that it's probably a, a kind of a mix of different people probably mostly young people if you're looking at the age of the people but that were involved in all of that and, and i just want to say also that um go, kind of going back to the to my thing about out of town out of towners versus in towners i think the consensus within kenosha whether it's true or not is that this was all out of towners who are doing all the violence and all of that. I don't think that there's a whole lot of evidence behind their claim, but that's that's sort of the narrative they're going with because they just couldn't see that people within their own city doing that kind of thing. And you know whether whether or not that's true, true or not, I don't think we'll ever even know the answer fully to if it was in town or out of town or people. But that's the narrative they're going with because that's sort of um, you know they're within Kenosha. This is another story I feel like that hasn't really played out yet in the national media but there's a huge push right now in kenosha something called uh kenosha stronger which they're going by is trying to like have a positive message not so much talking about like the 
I mean, they're still talking about... There, there's been some criticism. There's a BuzzFeed article that came out that this Kenosha Stronger effort... They didn't refer to it as Kenosha Stronger, but that was what was underlying the article. This effort is trying to kind of like whitewash the situation and just kind of just create a message of recovery. That's not true because there's a lot of... They're doing a lot of... Um, spray painting on the on the boards that are protecting buildings and they, they have a lot of messages about racial justice and all that so i think it's it's not fair to criticize them for that i would say but it does speak to the fact that people in kenosha are trying to put forward a little bit more of a, a positive message and a message of unity that i've seen at least on you know on my facebook for example from a lot of my old kenosha friends and i feel like that story hasn't really played out that much in the media i don't think the media has a lot of incentive to necessarily tell that kind of story they'd rather tell a story of division and kind of like a racial animosity and stuff but within kenosha i think i mean almost everyone i talk to has been opposed to the violence that took place and they're trying to move beyond that they're trying to move to a message of you know recovering and repairing the city to a place you know to a place that they thought it was before and also it kind of shows that people within kenosha really do love and care about their city you know, I'm not sure if that story will ever be told in the national media, but I think that it's an important one to just spell out. There's, there's a lot of pride. Um, there's, I think there's a quote that uh, someone gave that, you know, just someone who lived in Kenosha that I saw, is like people almost have like this like naive love of their city where it's like they love it more than they maybe should because of all of its flaws. But that's definitely a sentiment that prevails in the city. You know, what makes me really curious about the history of police relations in Kenosha is that um, – so if you look at the details of, of the shooting, um, it is not sort of the clean story that you would get from, for example, Philando Castile. Um, uh, Jacob Blake is not this um, sympathetic figure who did nothing wrong. Uh, I, I realized that there was a first round of stories about how he's trying to break up a fight and bring in a uh, gift to his friend's kid. And this stuff has, has not panned out in further reporting. And in fact, he was, uh, I believe, uh, had 911 called him on him because he intruded um, into the house of his girlfriend who he had sexually assaulted in the past. Um, and, um, you know, if you have a police shooting, uh, particularly police shooting by a white officer of a black um, unarmed person in a city like in a hyper politicized city like Portland or Seattle, I can understand how there's just, you know, automatically riots. Um, and I can also see the same thing happening in a place like Ferguson, where um, where there's this, you know, history of tensions between the community and the police so that you know, once any incident happens, regardless of what the circumstances are, it just explodes. Kenosha doesn't seem to fit into either of those boxes, you know, um, uh, unless unless I'm ignorant, which I may well be, since I'd, I'd never even heard of Kenosha before the story um, came up um, about the the history of police relations. But it, it doesn't sound like from anything I've heard so far that th- that it's that it's anything like a Ferguson. No, I mean, I mean, there's definitely like I was saying, there, there's been incidents is that that show that there's definitely been uh cases where there's been cops within the force that abuse their authority and have done some pretty horrible things but i mean that probably exists in almost any police force in terms of like the the broader kind of um just terrible relations between the police and the people of kenosha didn't exist when i grew up and i mean I'm a, i know i grew up as a white person in the city but i do have um, a stepsister who is half you know half white half black kind of thing because uh, the her father was African American. My mom is white. So, um, yeah, I mean, never anything I'd heard of that tensions were just like so bad and so simmering. I mean, I'm sure there's definitely distrust in some communities and all of that, but never. It, it's still shocked. I mean, the thing that that I think the story here it's just it, what changed in Kenosha probably more than ever before, allowing this to happen the way that it did is probably social media, right? I mean, like all of a sudden, how did I find out about this? Is like. I found out about it from from Twitter. And all of a sudden, Kenosha was trending on Twitter. I was like, "What? Like, why? Why is Kenosha trending on Twitter? It's either something just I, I would I, I wouldn't have even equated it to police. I probably just would have thought something silly happened there or, or whatever. And then all of a sudden, it's like this shooting, and I think it just allowed it to create a life of its own. And the video kind of going all over the place, both on Facebook. And Twitter, and I think it just created a life of its own, really. And then, of course, that's how people outside the community find out about it. Becomes a cause celeb or a cause celebre, and you know, then we have what we had in Kenosha, which is on the first day there was 
protests and some breaking into the the courthouse area and you know it the crescendo i would say is what happened on tuesday and i think that my my analysis of like how did it grow to become so violent is because the original source was at least some vi- you know violence towards the property itself and and you know destroying storefronts and like you everyone knows about the car lot video where all those cars are burned down i think once you start down that road um, it leads. It can lead to something. I think we've now seen the logical conclusion, both in Portland now, what happened yesterday, and in Kenosha earlier this week, we've seen counter protests, right wing shootings that that kind of they, they, these people feel like, oh, we're here to protect the city, and things are being things are being torn apart, things are being burned down, and we're here to quote unquote protect the city. I think that it creates those perfect dynamics, and it it kind of plays right into Trump's hands because. As I said, when this was happening, is this is going to become a Trump campaign ad? Um, and look, look, he's but the week after I send that tweet, he's coming to Kenosha to visit the destruction, and I think it's going to be a hard thing for the Biden campaign to contend with. It's kind of unfortunate that Kenosha has just become a political football, given it has its own interesting history and issues and stuff that should be more complex than just the destruction that happened from a police shooting, but that that's what it's obviously going to become is Kenosha. Well, if, the tru- if the truism used to be that all politics is local, it's like now with social media, all politics is national. Yeah. Or even international. Cause I mean, look, look at Kenosha became an international story. So it's not just that when something happens locally, it's now national news. It's that these, it doesn't sound like there are any specific origins locally in Kenosha for a conflagration like this, but um, it's like the national, um, sort of what's happening nationally is 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 the precipitating cause of these local reactions. You know, it, it no longer does it require a history of like local tensions with the police. It's like people see what's happening in 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 uh, Minneapolis and Portland and New York City and elsewhere, and then all of a sudden it becomes the narrative for them locally. Yeah, it's almost as if there's like some device or technology that's all uniting us in this one narrative. <laughs> that we're, you know, and we think like, you know, everything that's happening is just one thing in one place. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. OK, so I'm glad that you kind of brought that up. So I, I think that to, to me, yeah, I think that, that that you hit the nail on the head. It's it's um, it's kind of like no city has like its own unique. I mean, by the national narrative now, no city has its own unique dynamics that are really worth pondering or thinking about or analyzing or. Even, I mean, the, the the local people are not even necessarily worth listening to. Because, I mean, if you look at what even the African-American community is saying, I think this is extremely important to point out. The family of Jacob Blake, the leadership within the, the civil rights activist community in Kenosha, everyone is, is saying, we do not support the violence. We think that this is detestable. Um, so people are, are saying, don't do this. And yet it, it continued for days. It's because people want to project what what they have outwards into a place like Kenosha and kind of say, well, oh, well, there was that violence. So I think like, well, what does it matter? We can do, you know, violence is a logical outcome of this because of the, the origin point. And I think that's a unique, and I guess I would be also be curious to hear from you. I mean, it's not like it's unique to 2020 necessarily. I mean, it, it did exist after Ferguson. It has existed, I think, in Baltimore after and some other places where there were violent reactions, riots, and all that after. But I think the unique thing about 2020 after Minneapolis is it's become more normal um, just to completely write off or even like question whether these kind of violent reactions are good or useful or whatever you want to say. Like, I think it's just been like, it's kind of off the table for even questioning it in, in a way that's different than before and in a way that doesn't end up even listening to the local community, getting back to the full circle thing is that what I'm saying is the African American community, the white community, the Latino community in Kenosha are all saying like, this needs to stop. Like we need to rebuild and repair our community. There's this message of uh, Kenosha strong that they're using and they're just trying to create this different messaging and you know, mo- not, not move on, but like use this moment to unite. And that's really what's happening. This group is it's not a small group. It's, it's a city of a hundred thousand people the Facebook group already has over 7,000 people. So it's a good chunk of the city is in this Facebook group trying to be involved. They're doing stuff in different pockets of the city, showing pictures of what they're doing, creating T-shirts. It's become like, it's definitely become its own movement, definitely within the city. 
you're not hearing that story um, on the national level because I don't think it reflects what people want to see in Kenosha. Or what, and that's just one example. It could be elsewhere, too. I'm just kind of curious what you guys think about this moment and if things have kind of changed or just it's become a force in of itself. Well, I mean, we would be remiss not to note that there is now a, a book um, called In Defense of Looting, um, which has gotten a big platform on NPR right at the same time that all this stuff is happening. It's, it seems like, yeah, the, the left's response has been anywhere from denying the reality of what's happening on the ground to increasingly outright defending and supporting and um, and calling for it. Um, and I, I think there's been sort of a, this is also new, but like, you know, somebody was just shot and killed last night in, in Portland. And, um, you know, shortly after the killings in Kenosha, it does feel like we're in the process of crossing this Rubicon where we're moving from, you know, uh, apologetics for property destruction to the next logical step is going to be um, uh, apologetics, both on the left and the right. I don't mean to single out the left. Um, you know, the, the, I think we're seeing the same thing on the right as well, but, um, you know, uh, 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 political apologies for, for human violence up to and including murder. Yeah. And I, I think that's part of the reason we wanted to have the conversation is just that we're, we're taking a national or ideological narrative and we're placing it on every single thing that happens every single place. Like, you know, Jacob Blake's shooting was equivalent to what happened with George Floyd, which is, you know, equivalent to like Emmett Till, according to Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple. Uh, you know, he compared <laughs> Jacob Blake and Emmett Till. And it's like, actually, it's a completely different situation. The only similarity is that they're both black. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like, and I think that when we're not listening to people in the grounds in these places and we're not knowing any history there, we're not really even knowing the particular individuals involved, we're just transposing the national or historical narrative onto them. We're forgetting the fact that everybody is a little bit different and every situation is a little bit different. Um, and I think that's a lot of what's happening here and a lot of what we wanted to have the conversation here. So. Hi, this is Zed. If you like our show, please help us keep it going by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the back channel. Thanks.